Hey everybody, welcome back to the Outcast Haven for another deck profile. Today we have Nationals top four player, Dagan White on with us. He's going to share his Briar deck. He's going to talk about his experience with the whole um, Nationals, you know, tournament. It was a it was a big one. It was a grinder. Uh, you played for three days, so that was a ton. So thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, we'll jump right we'll in. We'll jump so right in. So congrats, first and foremost, on top four that's big time man i know you've had a good amount of success you know we've we've gotten to play a lot with you you come up to to minnesota and you've played at our rtns and some stuff we've seen you at other callings and you know you're you're a grinder you're like my favorite kind of player you just play all the time it's all you want to do is play flesh and blood and think flesh and blood and it's rewarded you so first off congrats on that and uh yeah let's jump into it so what was your experience like i know one of the things that impressed me both was your fortitude because you started off one and two right in your first draft as tradition it seems like i'm pretty sure at all those road to nationals i started like zero one zero two and just went out to make top eight each time so i guess that's just tradition for me now <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then you went you how long did you go before you lost another game because you went on a crazy hot i felt like i saw you after yeah. every round and i was like looking for the thumbs up like did you get it and you just never gave me a thumbs down like for like yeah. a day and a half yeah i'm pretty sure it was like yeah my losses were like the the two before top eight i think so yeah. so i went what was it four losses overall so two were draft and then two were before top eight i think so yeah <laughs> yeah it was it was an incredible run and uh you chose to go with briar i know um, during like Road to Nationals, you played Katsu, and then we played a lot of Seal and stuff. What led you to Briar? Was it uh, was it one of those ex like situations where you you thought it was just best deck, so you wanted to play it? Did you not find a solution to it? I know a lot of people kind of lived in that world where they were like, if I had an, a couple of weeks, I feel like I could have solved the matchup and played something else, but I couldn't solve it and feel comfortable with it, so I just played it because I couldn't salt, like I didn't have like a good option to, to beat it in my favorite deck or the deck that I felt comfortable with. I mean, yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, it just feels like better Katsu to me. So I just played it be mostly because of that. And like, I try and play all sorts of decks into it and would just lose. So it's like, well, if I can't beat it, I guess I'll just play it. You know, so it's pretty much one of those situations. Yeah. I, I feel that I know, like as somebody who plays a lot of Bravo, I felt like we, we had maybe one of the only shots at, teching a few things here and there to actually give us a matchup into it and even then it wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't like it was plus or anything it was just like i didn't have to shift decks and i know a lot of people like if i if you would have had to shift decks completely the best option is to play it because it's just so consistent right. and it's so constant in its ability to pressure so let's jump into the deck obviously run rosetta thorn like I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> if, if if it didn't, if it said the only reason any Rune Blade, I think at this point would run anything else is if they eroded this card to say Elemental Rune Blade, because why would you run anything else if you're running a Rune Blade deck and being forced to play non attack attack? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's just crazy. So, and then I know we were talking before, and you you go with the standard. Uh, I call it the Prism or the Wizard loadout. You have four pieces of equipment. Did you ever think of running anything else, or was it just it was these four and they were going to go every matchup? Uh, yeah, actually. So I was like strongly considering playing uh, Skeleta, mostly just for the armor, like in the mirror matches. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if I were going, uh, what was it? If I was going. Yeah, if I was going first, I need or second, I need the extra armor. But first, I wanted the tunic. That was the original game plan. And then I just realized that in my head, mentally, I was like, even if I only get one tunic counter, it's still worth at least three or four damage, which is still more than like the armor would give me for skeleton. So that's pretty much my logic there. So I just stayed with tunic the whole time. I I like that. I think that's something that enough people not enough people think about that the the math trade off. Right? If you get to swing one Rosetta off of tunic, right. It's effectively four damage for the one resource you got from Tunic, and then Tunic mm -hmm. still blocks for one. So it kind of overall nets you a resource and five damage versus right. Skeleta, which blocks three damage. So and gives you no resources. So theoretically, like the the value that you get from Tunic is just crazy high. And then mm -hmm. Grasp, it's a block. You make the rune chance on your off turns and swing. Yeah, it's just good. <laughs> yeah, it, like one blue gets you a rune chant and a sword swing. That's five damage. Like it's just yeah. good. 
it, it turns a it turns a blue into like you know rosetta rosetta light like you get a little a little diet rosetta <laughs> yeah so and then snappies i mean snappies is crazy like that that's a that's a card that's gonna stand the test of time in this game for sure yeah snatch his best friend <laughs> <laughs> especially in this deck where you can you know like plunder snatch for seven oh yeah and snappies on top of it it's it's nuts so let's go into your attack loadout and what you mm-hmm. decided to run for attacks um it seems like a lot of this is like what other people run but i i, I didn't see arcanic crackle in every deck was that just a, a you know three basically a zero for four I mean, it's actually better than that. It's really good. I mean, it's zero. It blocks three, which is good, but it has two separate instances of damage. You can get two embodiments off it, which is just threatening by itself. And then Arcanic Crackle is basically that card, but gives you a a buff on your damage to four, and then the fuse comes with your shockwave. Arcane. Yeah, or shockwave. Yeah, yeah sorry, yeah. shockwave. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, pretty it's, much. It's a, it's a, it's effectively like you get two instances of the same card that kind of require you to play them differently. Yeah, basically. Like the the upside of Crackle especially is that it works really well for one card hands. Like if you're forced to block, you can just threaten two embodiment tokens, like just off one card. Yeah. It's such it's such a high value card. And then Ball Lightning is just one of those cards that it, it's, gross. It's gross. <laughs> it's so painful to play against Ball Lightning. When somebody plays like Ball Lightning and then literally anything else, I'm just like, oh God, here we go. Like it, if, oh, yeah. you, if you lead with ball lightning, everybody just, is that like a, does everybody just sigh? Is that like an auto sigh? Well, the worst part is like, if you lead with it, your opponent doesn't know if they want to block. Cause you could have some like gross on hits later. And if you have more than one ball lightning, you want to block the later ones. Cause it just stacks up more damage. So, I mean, yeah, it's just a gross card. The free <laughs> go again. <laughs> Yeah, the free go again is the thing, right? Like, if it was a zero for three that required some other source of go again, it would be way less annoying to play against. But the fact that you just lead with it and you're like, all right, just so you know, the rest of this turn is going to be a pain in your butt. Yeah, I mean, you barely block anyway, so like, that's barely an issue. (laughs) Yeah. So it's also disgusting with Sting of Sorcery too. If we uh, get into that later, yeah, we'll we'll definitely <laughs> that that interaction will come up when we hit that non attacks because that's an interaction that I hate personally. It's so, so gross. <laughs> um, so walk us through. I know one of the texts you were you you had a you had some really funny stories about your experiences with trying to get your hands on evergreens because evergreen oh, yeah. was kind of like a last <laughs> a last second thing. But this is like a perfect time to, to interject some fun. So tell us a little bit about your evergreen. You you try to get a hold of evergreens kind of last minute, right? Oh yeah. I mean, there's, there's a couple stories that go along with that card. Honestly, it's probably the favorite card in the deck because it lets me win matches. I have like no purpose in winning. Like it's absurd. And it just pops phantasm. So that's cool too. But, uh, so the night before the tournament, I was trying to figure out the deck because I was on Earth Briar for like two weeks straight. And I was like, this is just more consistent. So I'll just play this. So the night before, um, there was one story specifically that's funny to me. Um, we were in the hotel room at the time and outside of the hotel, we could have sworn there were people talking about Bravo and like matchups and stuff. So I just like rip open the door and I'm like, yo, dog, you got any evergreens? They just look at me and they're like, what? They're out there like smoking, so they thought we meant weed. And I was like, "Oh, all right, never mind. My bad. <laughs> Let's just go back in." So we couldn't find any, so we actually had to go to the convention center early. Uh, three of us split up to hit all the vendors immediately to make sure we could find some because we registered the deck the night before with evergreens in there. So if we didn't get them, we we're kind of screwed. But luckily, we did. So yeah, but yeah, that was its own thing. <laughs> the, the classic vendors come into the rescue in the last minute. I, oh, yeah. I, I had it in Vegas where I accidentally left my towering titans when i was doing my deck pro my or my deck i left my towering titans on my kitchen table so i had to like rush to a vendor and that's always like the biggest panic moment it's like come on please tell me you're not missing this one rare and also that evergreen interestingly enough became that card that a lot of people added in as the solution Mm -hmm. to control right because that's what you're doing so if you want to do you want to explain how that works yeah i mean at worst it's just better ninth blade right like you play that specifically for Prism, and this serves that same purpose. It's seven power, it gets around uh, Herald of Triumph, still pops it. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, in the control matchups like Bravo or Oldham, you basically just shove in your entire sideboard. Mm-hmm. And then every time that Evergreen shows itself, you just shove in the Arsenal and you hit them with it. And they have to block with two cards, and you're effectively zero because it just goes right back into the deck and you just keep going. And towards the end of the game, all you really have left is Blues and Evergreens anyway. So you just kind of keep 
shoving that through as much as you can just to have better card economy. Yeah. It's interesting because when when Bravo played against Chain, there was um, like a, a really easy out in snag. But Briar is different because the deck needs to be, you need to control and fatigue it in a very specific way. Like as somebody who played that matchup and it made, it was an interesting matchup because typically when you're playing fatigue, like guardians stay pretty far ahead as far as like their, the thickness of their deck and their ability to have deck. Right. But in the Briar matchup, you have to run less cards because you can't just shove everything in because you need specific block. You can't be blocking with two blocks as often as you could with chain because things like Electrify and Ball Lightning on the stack really create issues where the turn can spiral. So it's Evergreen creates an interesting problem for control because control has to block really efficiently, which means they run less cards. And to your point, Evergreen actually counter fatigues them. Yes. And what because that that's a real thing. Like counter fatiguing fatigue is a kind of a hilarious strategy that lightning yeah i did it twice over the course of the day it was really funny (laughs) yeah when somebody's like i'm gonna fatigue you and at the end of the game you look over you're like are you now i'm gonna fatigue you i think so yeah basically my game plan in that matchup was to kind of just slow down to their pace almost so a lot of people just kind of autopilot deck in a way where they'll just like throw multiple plunder runs to get go again i just kind of did it one at a time you know to get the attack Mm -hmm. value out of it so you're trading cards and then just come in eventually pitch stack in a way so there's multiple ways you can do this. You can either load up with a really tall Exude Confidence, and they just can't block it if they have defense reactions, since it's gross. Um, Evergreen Looping. Uh, I have six defense reactions in the sideboard, so that helps with uh, like hammer swings and stuff. And then uh, you can also pitch stack in a way... I know a lot of other people are doing this, like if they didn't have Evergreen, where they'd pitch stack in a way, so their late game they'd have like a turn of multiple ball lightnings with the Sting of Sorcery to kind of get over as well. Yeah. So there's like there's like three ways to get through. So let's let's talk about that because I think that's an interesting you mentioned the defense reaction. So that's an interesting mm-hmm. ad that I know we were talking about and you mentioned um adding them in for just specific matchup. What matchups did the D Reacts go in? What did they come out in? And you know, did you find they were a go first, go second kind of decision, or was it just matchup based? Um, so I didn't really use defense reactions that much. Um, control, they would obviously go in because um, they're just more efficient. You know, if you're trying to go to the fatigue game, that's that's just good. Um, Sigil, I did play in the mirror, uh, going first or second. But sync, I only played going second, and I don't know if that was correct because it was kind of like midnight the night before kind of thing. But it seemed good on paper. So yeah, it's it's one of those things that that's a card that I know you guys added into your list or you added into mm-hmm. your list that you didn't see in a ton of lists like people weren't running the defense reactions but being matchup based i think is okay and what were what cards were you thinking or what cards would have gone in instead of those cards if you didn't have run them if like if i didn't run the defense reactions yep or um i don't know i mean at that point I'd probably just try and raise them and hope for the best i don't know what the alternative would be i suppose yeah cuz you would have basically just ended up trying to find non attacks or attacks to go yeah. in that place like that's there's not really another option I, and and they were just there i mean they, they give you some some backups just in case things go wrong right so my thought process mainly behind those was that in the mirror a lot of the time it'll come down to like whoever whiffs a turn yep and if you play sig below and sigils you're less likely to whiff and you can punish them with that because like you come in with zero for fours all day and you can just kind of block them one for one until they whiff and then you just punish them and take tempo back you know yeah. So you play kind of a more mid-range game plan, like when I used to play Katsu. Mm-hmm. I'd play mid-range to like punish all the aggro players. It's basically the same kind of concept here. Nice. So now let's talk about like your non-attack loadout. I know a lot of people ran just blue and red plunders. You have like the full rainbow. Is there oh, yeah. a, you just want that for the card draw primarily? I mean it, it any of them are good in Arsenal. They come out with a buff and it turns the entire turn every time you play it and it's just threatening on hit like if it hit if you hit with any of your attacks they're just probably going to pop off so there's no reason not to run the full nine and then so when you when you're playing like that that strategy of going wide what what did you find was like typically your your normal did you normally go three wide four wide like was three like your typical attack width in terms of attack action cards or was it normally two or four what, what would you yeah, say like, is like a normal like two or three on average yeah and then, I mean, plunder runs basically allow you to potentially go 
four or even five yes because your deck is running so many go agains and so many zero costs that you can unless you draw a non-attack right like every attack you draw just immediately can get yeah. slammed down if you know everything you draw is gas <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so you got electrify red which is just a crazy card because it results in a ton of problems for people if they can't block or something goes wrong i know one of the plays that's interesting in briar that you don't see is that like exude has go again or can you can create oh, like, yeah. go again and exude and then also buff it like i had one guy where i i mean it saved my life as a bravo player that i actually have access to 10 and 11 attack cards because he was like nimbleism plunder run from arsenal exude mm -hmm. with go again for that's 10. disgusting and yeah. i was like oh thank god i've got my crippling crush in hand or like i can't use this defense reaction and it's for the rest of the combat chain too it's not yeah. even just the exude like it's bonkers yeah it's it's able to just kind of shut down so much and you demand that they have like a really specific answer and it also punishes people right if they don't have a way to block it with a card and they're holding something like a sigil it just it continues to add more dead cards in their hand that they can't defend and protect themselves with while you just completely pop off. So you have Sting of Sorcery in here. I know that was a card that some people didn't run. I don't know why you wouldn't run Sting of Sorcery if you run Ball Lightning. Yes. Um, right. But do you want to explain the interaction with Sting and Ball? Because I think sometimes people miss the absurd value of the Sting Ball oh, interaction. Yeah. I mean, first of all, it's a blue on a deck that just could use more blues anyway. So that's really cool. Um, cause otherwise you'd just be playing the plunder runs and captain's call, but the, yeah, the interaction with ball lightning is like insane. So, well, even not even ball lightning, just any of the attacks, each of them create like a hit trigger, not a hit trigger, a damage trigger for embodiment of earths. Mm -hmm. It's like each one that hits, they're going to get more embodiment of earth. So eventually you can get to the point where you just have like four or five embodiments. And next turn, if you have to block, you just block with like a plunder run for five. It's stupid. But yeah, with ball lightnings. If you play your first ball lightning, um, it increases the amount that Sting of Sorcery would deal because it's the ball lightning that's dealing damage. So your first ball lightning would do two damage. Now, if you play another ball lightning, that one's going to do three damage because they stack. Mm -hmm. And then each of those can give you embodiments, and it just makes the entire turn gross. Yeah, that's that's like one of those interactions that's absolutely crazy to me because it was one of those moments where you kind of do the math. You're like, oh... This is this is going to get problematic. And to your point, that that's the interaction you were referencing with the that was like the out that other people who didn't run the evergreen loop. That's kind of the mm -hmm. out that they used, right? Yeah, I just tried to set up an end game where they just do that huge hand of like sing a sorcery into a hand of ball lightnings and just yeah. does crazy unblockable damage. Yeah, because you, you a lot of the a lot of the solutions to Briar were people running like two null rune because it helped kind of mitigate some of the damage like two null rune in the shield uh, mm -hmm. was theoretically covering up three of the four Rosetta damage and that worked out really well I think for a lot of the those decks because that was kind of their one out potential but then until you just smack them with the evergreen right like, yeah no matter what they do you're fine <laughs> yeah that the evergreen becomes like a great solution and then the sting of sorcerer becomes really problematic if you just pitch stack it where it just you sting and then mm -hmm. it's like oh two arcane now this is three arcane and this right. is four arcane it's like yeah. oh you only have I mean, you can pitch to that but yeah. they're gonna hit so <laughs> yeah like you can pitch to it but then you're just basically pitching and you're still taking the physical damage which then also triggers on the ball lightning effects because that's right, i think right. the thing that people miss that damage like, also stacks right yeah so you end up in like this loop where you're like, oh no, I think I just die. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 what we call in the card game world, inevitability. Um, yep. Sometimes you just lose to it. So the captain's call, how often did you find, did you ever find yourself using the go again? Or was it just a zero blue that gave you a plus two option? Uh, very rarely. A lot of the time you just get the go again off the embodiment. Uh, so you use the pump most of the time. But occasionally if you get a hand with like that and like three attacks, you have to just play it for the go again. Because then you can swing with sword afterwards, and it's still like an okay turn. Yeah, it, did you like? Did you feel like you swing with sword every turn? I like. I think a lot of times people miss that about these decks too. Is like that theory behind? Were you tr always trying to get to sword? Was the sword something that was more based on like your matchup, or was it like that was the thing you had to get to every turn? It really depends. A lot of the time, I'm just kind of throwing my hand at them um, because you don't get embodiment triggers off the sword. So you want to try and get those to make sure that your opponent never gets a real chance to pivot because you can just block with like two cards and still be really threatening on next turn. 
But obviously, if the sword presents itself, or if you have a tunic counter, that's mainly what tunic counters are for, is for the sword or electrify. So, mm-hmm. um, if they have no null rune, then uh, yeah, sword's pretty good too. But <laughs> yeah. So, and then kind of the the finishing touch on it in the the creme de la creme, the old uh, lightning press, mm-hmm. which which you know just presents an awful experience for your opponent um i i think my favorite lightning presses are always on things like um arcanic shockwave where you get to show it to them yeah. as your fuse option and you're just like hey just so you know this it's is gonna flex immediately turn. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> play this whole turn what... it's it's like can you imagine having to reveal razor reflex to your opponent like sometimes that feels like oh i'm giving something away but more often than not yeah. it's just like no now you have to play around this. That doesn't change my turn. I always have the option to have it and arsenal it, but now you have to deal yeah, with it. Yeah, exactly. And your opponent has they cannot play around it. Like if they overblock, you arsenal it. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, you lightning press and get the on hits. Like it's a lose lose. It's just really good. Yeah. It, it and it's them, lightning for fuse. Yep. It puts them in a spot where there's just kind of nothing they can do about it. Like you entwine lightning, show them the lightning yeah. press. Now the rest of the turn they have to think about it. It's just right. awful to deal with. So Going forward, do you think there's anything that you would change about the deck? Um, honestly, in my eyes, this looks to be like very close to perfect. The only thing I can really think of changing in the sideboard was Sink Below, because it's kind of a last-minute decision. But I don't think it would really change much else, to be completely honest. Yeah. Like, it's just so consistent. I tried to make it do what it's trying to do every game, and it does that job pretty well. So Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that was like the the thing that made the deck such a good option for so many people is that you know in any card game consistency is key but in flesh and blood where you're cycling your hand away pretty much every Mm -hmm. turn consistency becomes even more important because you're punished when your deck is even remotely inconsistent one inconsistent turn can just end the game for you you whiff one turn they get tempo back and they can just run over you yep like with this deck what's crazy about briar is he can lose one tempo like one turn of tempo and still be fine because you have the embodiments to block that turn but if you get two in a row, you just lose. Yeah, a, a lot. Yeah, like the. It's interesting how the embodiments can create kind of a situation where you actually can block with a bad hand. Mm-hmm. Like if you draw too many non-attacks and you can't put a bunch of pressure back, you can kind of salvage the tempo by being able to overblock. But then once you lose a turn, you also kind of weirdly lose your option to block because mm-hmm. if you're not creating any embodiments, now all of a sudden your deck blocks bad for real like right right you know it's it's a classic rune blade deck in that it it kind of always blocks bad but you get kind of an out to that with your ability to use your embodiments whereas most rune blades are just constantly punished for it and so when you lose that that turn of tempo and you have to pitch a blue make a rune chant and swing sword and get zero oh, feels so bad yeah it's just it's just ball game like there it is that's that's the death now but um yeah man so congrats again uh i just want to give you a chance if you want to give any shout outs to anybody uh yeah uh shout out to the rest of the minnesota crew uh patrick and chris uh they helped with testing a lot and to basically convince me that earth is a bad deck so <laughs> that helps a lot because i'd be playing a worse deck probably if it weren't for that and then testing with that lexi matchup the night before um also i'm really glad i convinced them to not play sonata i think that card is bad personally because any card that can whiff, I just, I, I don't like playing it. <laughs> Consistency is king. I mean, that's the name yeah. of the game. So. Consistency in flesh and blood will always win. <laughs> oh, also shout out to Jordan Nell for the calling. Uh, I gave him the deck like the night before the calling because he was playing Prism and Nationals. Mm-hmm. And he's like, hey, can you give me a list? I see you're doing well. And I was like, sure, man, here you go. And he goes and just top safe the calling like it's nothing. <laughs> like <laughs> having like never played that deck before. It's wild. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's mind boggling. So but again, congrats to you, man. I know, you know, you've been grinding, you've been working really hard and, and pushing yourself really hard to get to this place and you had so many like tops and, and close calls along the way where you were just right on the edge and uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you you pushed it to top four, man. We were we were excited to see you do it. It was cool to see you get there and you know, all the work that you put in, all the time and effort you put in, it paid off and, and you deserved it and we're excited for you. So Congrats again. Uh, we're really excited for you. We're excited to see you. Know, now everybody knows your name, so they're looking for you. Yes, they're looking for your next, your next experience, your next minute. So uh, 
they're they're ready to see the next thing you got coming. So everybody, thanks for watching. Dagan again, thanks for staying on. Everybody, um, you know, leave leave notes in the comments if you have questions or anything. We'll try to pass stuff along. I can shoot Dagan a message if he has to answer anything, or if you just want to say congrats, hit him in the comments. The man deserves some congratulations. So we appreciate you guys always watching this stuff, and uh, we'll see you next time. Peace out. Appreciate it.